Well, as, as Heather said, um, today is the third in our series on the 10 ox herding pictures. And they are a series of pictures with accompanying poems used in the Zen tradition to illustrate the stages of spiritual development. And if you've missed them, and uh, the other ones, the first two, if you, when you leave, if you see one of these little cards at the back, it just shows you how to get the other ones, whether they're, they're on a podcast or online, on YouTube or, or whatever. So you, if you, you can catch up on those if you want to. Now, Zen aims through meditation to enable us to realize the true nature of reality. That's the purpose of Zen. But in this 10 weeks, we're not studying Zen. All we're doing is using Zen tools, and in our case, the 10 oxiding pictures, to reflect on the true nature of reality. These are just an excuse. I could be doing the parables. I could be doing, you know, anything. But we've chosen to use these, the 10 oxiding pictures. Um, and there are many different uh, depictions uh, of the ten oxiding pictures. You've got the ones there, which, uh, which are in your, in your little leaflet. But here's another one. This is number five, and it's completely different from number five in your set there. And that's leading the ox home. And if you want to see after the service, there are a, a, a totally different series of the ten there. And you can go and have a look at those uh, and see what they look like. So they're really, they represent the stages of awakening, stages on the journey in finding the essence of things. They enable us to see our place in that journey, and they show the challenges and the pitfalls of each stage. And if we think we're already there, then they give us a perspective as you know, how much further we, we might want to go. For those of you that do, I said this last week, but you know, it's like 12th century spiral dynamics. That's exactly what this is. And if you look at the pictures, if you look at the first one, in the first week, we looked at that first picture, which is on the, on the, on the, on the, just on the inside page, searching for the ox. And that picture really represented the ox herd being lost, and you know, we're the ox herd, the people in the world being lost. Like most in the world, he's been led astray by the cares of the world, the desires to get on and succeed, to attain and to make our way. But something reminds him that there's more to life than this. The whip in his hand, he thinks that reminds him that he has a purpose in his life. And, and we all have our own little whips that remind us. It could be a, a yearning for meaning or an emptiness about life. It just reminds us that there's something else uh, to be looking for. Um, and as we go on, uh, you know, the, like the boy, we search for the meaning in our life. Once we have that sense of emptiness, we then start to search ourselves for the meaning in life. In the boy's case, it's the ox, which represents his true nature. You know, whatever you like to call it, God or the ground of all being. That's what he's searching for. And he makes a vow to find the ox. And this vow is what keeps him going. And our vow is to, is to reach, to find our own true nature. That, that's the sort of the whole journey that we go through. And in the second week, if you look at the second picture, it really is about seeing the traces, it's called. And in that, you know, the idea there is that he knows that the vessels, however varied, are all of gold. He, he knows, he's got a sense that he's connected with everything, yet he, he can't really work out what's going on. And he, he's just, you know, he's doing a bit of meditation, he's reading scriptures, he he's just sort of gets a sense, you know, when you start on the spiritual journey, you get a sense that there's something out there but you're not quite sure what it is or, or, or what's going on. And, and that's what it's called seeing the traces. And we have to be willing, in order to see those traces, to empty ourselves of all the knowledge that we have in the world. We're full up with our knowledge. We know, we know, you know E equals MC squared. We know how things work. We know psychotherapy. We know what we're doing. We have to let go of that and empty ourselves and to not know. And if we're willing to do that, we begin to see the spiritual traces. We see something that hints at our true nature. And in the picture, the boy's looking up, he's energetic, and he's going forward. 
And we have to have endurance to keep on in the spiritual path, not to rest satisfied in any idea that seems pleasing, some truth handed down by others. But we have to keep seeking for our own truth and realisation, doing our practice, reading books, following the path that's open to us. This is going on the spiritual journey. And you know, if you get a sense in your own life that life, that spiritual life has, has stalled, or if you feel you're not making progress, then it's down to that moment-by-moment moment commitment to seeing the traces, to opening ourselves up, to not knowing. And it's not an ignorant not knowing or a lazy not knowing. This not knowing is a willingness to reevaluate our lives, to relook at our lives, a different kind of knowing, one that works by linking what's within our feelings and senses, and what's without. The traces are hidden, but once you have the nose for finding them, once you're open to not knowing and have your commitment to the vow of the heart engaged, then, as it says in the poem for that thing, your nose reaches to the heavens and nothing can conceal it. So that's the sort of you know, previously on uh, bit. And now today, what we're looking at is seeing the ox. So if you look at that picture three, which is seeing the ox, and this is the poem. The boy finds the way by the sound he hears. He sees thereby into the origin of things, and all his senses are in harmonious order. In all his activities, it is manifestly present. That's your tr the true nature. It is like salt in water and glue in colour. It is there, though not distinguishable as an individual entity. When the eye is properly directed, he will find that it is no other than himself. On a yonder branch perches a nightingale cheerfully singing. The sun is warm and a soothing breeze blows on the bank of the willows are green. The ox is there all by himself. Nowhere is he to hide himself. The splendid head decorated with stately horns. What painter can reproduce him? He's fully present, the boy, and he sees the ox. Now, in last week's poem, Seeing the Traces, the boy knows that vessels, however varied, are all of gold and the objective world is a reflection of the self. In, in that second one, he knows that there is a connectivity between all things and there is essential nature between all things. He knows that all reality is infused by that ground of all being, that this lectern, the floor, the pillars, Steve... You and me are all infused by that divine nature. We are all reflection of that divine nature. And I said last week, I thought that was a pretty advanced state, you know, that you know all this, at number two. But this week, seeing the ox is an even more advanced state. What, what they're talking about here is the experience that many people aim at in the spiritual life which is enlightenment. This is the Sartori experience. And we're only at number three. And already we've got to that Sartori experience. This is the moment when, having done your practice for a while and kept looking at our true nature, which actually the doors of perception, which, which is what Aldous Huxley referred to, it, the doors of perception open. And there is revealed the ox. There is revealed that experience of Sartori. And of course, Aldous Huxley, in, in calling the doors of perception, is quoting William Blake, the 19th century mystic, who said in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, William Blake says, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks in a cavern. 
He says, it's like living in a cave. You can just see narrow chinks. But when the doors of perception open, then he sees infinity. And of course, these doors of perception is what Jim Morrison named his band after. They're called The Doors because of William Blake and because of Aldous Huxley. That's by the way. But wherever it came from, the picture of the doors of perception opening and everything appearing to man as infinite. That, that is what we're talking about. And what's happening here is that we're given a glimpse of the nature of reality, our true nature, the ground of all being, that which the traces have been leading towards. What happens is that by, by following the traces, when you follow the traces, when you read the books and stuff like that, you sort of get an idea of what you're looking for. You know, you read the books that you are in everything and everything is you. All vessels of gold and a reflection of the self. You are one with everything. You know, you read all this stuff and you get, sort of, you, you know, what does it all mean? I, I, I don't quite understand. You hear the ideas, you read the books, you meditate. And in doing so, you sort of get an idea of what you're looking for. You don't know quite what it is, but you get an, a sense of what it might be. And in our meditation, we become very still. We become present. We enter into a meditative state, you know, what's called samadhi, which is the sense of that luminosity of all things, of the mind, the equanimity of all things, peace and rest. We've entered into that. But that's, that's samadhi. It's not sartori. Sartori, that experience of enlightenment, joins up the dots. We were wandering along in our lives, and then suddenly, bam, a sound, or you know, the, the Zen masters say it is the plop of the frog in the pond. Just a sound. That's why it says, by the sound he hears. Maybe it's a sound, maybe it's a sound, but suddenly, there it is. The ox standing there. And it's almost as if someone joined up the dots and the picture is complete. The boy finds the way by the sound he hears. He sees thereby into the origin of things, and all his senses are in harmonious order. That is that experience when people go, wow! He sees, he hears. It comes through the senses, and it is, of course, the mind joining up the dots and revealing the infinite, which has been hinted at in the traces. We move from being, as Blake put it, closed up, seeing all things through narrow chinks in our cavern, and suddenly seeing the infinite right before us. As Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians, and now we see a reflection as in a mirror. Now we see a reflection as in a the mirror. Then we will see face to face. He's talking about that experience. It is the moment where our true nature it's the, it's the moment when our true nature is revealed. And it can come just for a moment. I mean, I was talking last week about going to India and coming back and, and you know, beating my mother knowing that I'd had some spiritual experience because I, I, uh, I came off the plane wearing Indian clothes and claiming to be vegetarian. I, I then went and read uh, Autobiography of a Yogi and I, you know, sent off the spiritual books and, you know, I wasn't interested in any girlfriends except the spiritual ones, you know. I, I was really sort of going, I was seeing those traces. And, you know, then after a while, you know, I had that experience. You know, I was, uh, it, was it, it was strange. I, I wasn't sort of, I wasn't looking for it. Now. Well, I was looking for it, actually. I, I did want to have the experience. And so for whatever reason, and I just, you know, it's, it's very difficult to stri des describing these sorts of experiences because they sound weird. You know, they don't necessarily, when you have an experience, it doesn't match up with everybody else. But for me, I was sitting in a room with a group of friends, and it, and it was a sound thing for me. And there was this music playing on the, on the, uh, on the, um, on the record player. I can't tell how long ago it was. It was music on the record. And someone said to me, do you play the guitar? And I, I said, I didn't. And they said, well, why don't you have a go? So I picked up my guitar, and I was listening to the sound and trying to, to move my fingers in a similar way. And it was a sound thing. And while I was doing that, suddenly my perspective changed. 
And, you know, at the moment, you know, there's David here and there's me over here. And, you know, the way I look out at everybody, you know, we're, 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 I'm here and you're there. And what happened in the sh that shift in reality is that suddenly I experienced myself as part of something infinitely greater than myself. It was almost as if that the something was coming through me, creating me as a reality. And as I looked out, it was almost there were millions of little optical fibers that went out into the room and just connected everything up. And I just looked into an infinite. And I just, I just went, wow. It was a sort of major shift in the reality. And, I, and, and as I looked around, I just sort of, I just knew what everybody had been talking about. I understood all those little bits just fitted into place. And, you know, the experience, you know, it went on for a couple of hours. And I haven't had an ex that experience since. But it was a major change in my understanding of reality. I mean, my, my direction in my life went boom at that moment. And the reason I'm here, really, is because of that experience. You know, the reason I'm doing what I do right now, I, I just felt, uh, eventually, I'll talk a little bit about this, uh, uh, you know, in subsequent weeks, but having had that glimpse, I just felt it was my duty to communicate the availability of that experience. That there was a possibility of actually, there was a reality that, you know, newsreaders, it, nobody admits to that reality existing. We're all, you know, everything's separate and we are fighting each other and stuff like that. But I had a glimpse of something that was totally different. And it was an amazing experience. And it, it, it was that sort of glimpse into a different nature of reality. The boy finds the way by the sound he hears. He sees thereby into the origin of things. And all his senses are in harmonious order. In all his activities, it is manifestly present. It is like salt in water and blue in color. That experience for me was that although everything you said, I could just see the connection with everything. I was part of it. There was something coming through me. I was seeing it. There was an infiniteness. It was there, though not distinguishable as an individual entity. When the eye is properly directed, he will find that it is no other than himself. On a yonder branch perches a nightingale, cheerfully singing. The sun is warm, and a soothing breeze blows, and the bank of the willows are green. The ox is there all by himself. Nowhere is he to hide. It's just obvious. The splendid head decorated with stately horns. What painter could reproduce him? It's impossible to reproduce that experience. Each of our experiences in this way will be different. For some, it will be seeing. For others, it'll be hearing. It's referred to the hearing is known as the music of the spheres. If you look it up on, on Wikipedia, you'll see. That is an experience of a similar enlightenment, but through, through hearing. For some, it'll just be the stopping of a continuum and a clear present moment. What qualifies is a sudden moment of knowing. It's a sudden moment of knowing that goes beyond understanding. It's an aha. It's a yes. It's, it's I see now. Now, I'm not going to ask anyone to share, you know, so don't panic about that. But who here has had an experience like that, if different? Put your hands up. Right up so people can see. If you look around, quite a few people. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, isn't that great? Put your hands up. Right, so people can see. Look around. Put your hand up if you've had that sort of experience. It's worth looking around. Thank you. That's great. This is, an ex this is an experience that happens right through the main religions, all the main religions. Now, it makes sense, you know, why would, you know, if you burrow into Jeff, into his essence down there, why would it be a different experience just because if he's a Muslim or he's a Buddhist or he lives in... Kathmandu or he lives in Swindon in England. He, it's the humanity. There's a reality, a, a deep experience of reality. And I think this experience goes right the way through all religions. From Moses in the burning bush, if that's not one of those experiences, I don't know what it is. You know, I am that I am. That's what God says to him. To Elijah in the still small voice. Paul on the road to Damascus. Pretty similar. The revelation of John. 
to Jesus saying that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. That's a pretty clear description of that experience. Or the kingdom of God is within you. Boom. You know, similar. It's a, it's, it's, it's a mystical experience. And even in Underhill, it describes mysticism. Everybody thinks, oh, what's mysticism? Mysticism is the art of union with reality. This is what um, uh, Evelyn Underhill says. She says, the mystic is the person who has attained that union to a greater or lesser degree, or who aims at it, or in believes in such an attainment. So it's, it's the experience of union with re reality. And reality, uh, my favorite de definition of reality, is that which continues to exist after you've stopped believing in it. Reality is that which continues to exist after you stop believing in it. And this experience of that reality is mirrored in the, all the great religions. In the Hindu Upanishads, it says, in the heart of all things and whatever there is in the universe, in the heart of all things dwells the Lord. He alone is the reality. The self is one, unmoving. It moves swifter than thought. The senses do not overtake it, for always it moves not. From the ignorant, it is far distant, yet it's near. It is within all, it is without all. He who sees all beings in the self and the self in all beings hates none, goes before. Remaining still, it outstrips all that run. Without the self, there is no life. That's the Hindu Upanishads. Similar description. From the Tao Te Ching, which is the Taoist scripture, Look and it can't be seen. Listen and it can't be heard. Reach and it can't be grasped. Above it isn't bright. Below it isn't dark. Seamless, unnameable. It returns to the realm of nothing. Form that includes all forms. Image without image. Subtle beyond all conception. Approach it and there is no beginning. Follow it and there is no end. You can't know it but you can be it at ease in your life. Just realize where you came from. This is the essence of wisdom. I, th I just think it's so interesting that all these descriptions are the same. The Radiant Sutras, I am everything, infusing everything. Define me, become absorbed in the intense experience. Go all the way, be drenched in the energies of life, enter the world beyond separation. And even in the Quran, this is Muhammad describing his experience at the center of the Quran. When I was midway on the mountain, I heard a voice from heaven saying, Oh, Muhammad, you are the apostle of Allah, and I am Gabriel. I stood gazing at him, moving neither forward nor backward. Then I began to turn my face away from him. But towards every region of the sky I looked, I saw him as before. Before every region of the sky that I looked, I saw him as before. It's the Enlightenment experience. It's Sartori, whatever you like to call it. Now, many people see this as the end point of the spiritual journey. We do our meditation. We notice the traces. We get to this end point of enlightenment. But the reason that this is only picture three is because it's only an experience it's only an experience, it's only a taste of the senses. And this reality, the true nature, is not of the senses. It's not of the senses. It says in the Tao Te Ching, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. And in that little poem it says, what painter can reproduce him. And, you know, as I said in the first week, our true nature has always been with us. It is not something that we've lost. It is like the spectacles that we're looking for that are right on the end of our nose. Where are my spectacles? We've never lost our true nature. Our true nature is not an experience that comes and goes. Our true nature is always with us. And the pictures show us how to arrive at this always with us state rather than a peak experience such as Satori. 
It is an always with us state. Yamada Mamoun, who's one of the big authors on this subject, says, you, he's talking to, 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 to monks in his monastery. He says, you persevered in your practice till you clearly saw the ox. Still, you have not really caught the ox. You have just caught a glimpse from behind. You still have seven more stages to go. To catch the ox and train it is no easy task, but first you must catch sight of it. You've all come to the monastery and now walk around hoping to catch a glimpse of the ox, but when you're out begging, when you're sweeping in the gardens, the ox is there all around you. It would be a great shame if you didn't see the ox everywhere. That ox is just lying there in the fallen leaves, in the sand that's flying off the tip of your broom. That's why one glimpse is not enough. I say, I, I can remember, you know, I changed a great deal after that experience. I changed in the direction of my life. But I'll talk about this more next week. In the essence, the way that I live didn't change much. I carried on smoking. I carried on with my dysfunctional relationships. I carried on. You know, I didn't, just because I had that glimpse, it didn't change much in the way that I lived my life. You know, it's like I've gone and seen a good film. Wow, it was a great film. No, where's the drink? You know, that sort of thing. It, it didn't shift it. I still lived a dysfunctional life and all that entailed. It was just that now, you know, I had a more elevated aim. Rather than wanting, you know, my aim now, I used to be in advertising, my aim now was not to get, you know, to the top in advertising. I wanted to get to the top spiritually now. <laughs> you know, I just shifted. I went into a different career method. Which is why you get so much com consumer spirituality. Enlightenment, it really is what really pushes that consumer spirituality. Doing a course here, getting an experience there. Our true nature is the ocean within which we exist. We are like the sponge at the bottom of the ocean with our true nature flowing through and all around us. There is nowhere to go. There is nothing to get. And until we can reach that point, we're still very much on the way. It's no good to stop at this glimpse and say, right, that's it. We've only simply reached understanding. What we're looking for is immersion in reality, being the sponge in the flow of the ocean.